And I, I, I want to say I was a diva. Can you say you was a diva yeah. at a funeral? Yep. I was a diva. Like, I, I said, don't bring him in. Wow. Where's the music? Mm. Play the music. Yeah. So in this podcast, I've chosen to talk about a subject that is really sensitive for me. Um, and it's about grief. Um, I think it's appropriate because even though it's a difficult topic, many of us are experiencing grief right now. We're losing people. We are having a pandemic that people are being killed. (laughs) People are dying through natural causes. People are dying by accidents. But it happens. And Winging It is all about talking about the things that have happened to me and those around us. So I am joined today by one of my dearest friends um, who I have experienced grief with, both on her side and my side. Yeah. So, for Keisha. Cam. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me. We both lost our parents. So Shakisha's lost her dad and I've lost both parents. Mm-hmm. And we were both at each other's parents' funerals. Yep. Um, Go support system. This is it. <laughs> I know. But that has made our friendship stronger. For sure. Because we both have a common bond in terms of grief. So tell me about um, how dad died. Um, so my dad was ill for years um long story short he caught mrsa when i was in college so maybe about 2005 2006 um because he just went for a routine um, he went for a routine operation caught mrsa um and ended up therefore having 33 further operations um they brought him back to life multiple times. He had multiple organ failure and he survived all of that. Um, ended up in a care home, um, for years. And then one morning he just woke up and then died. And how old was he? 50. He died five, four days after his 50th birthday. If you can go back to that day that he died, mm. what were your feelings on that day? Mm-mm. <laughs> Um, I went for a range of feelings. I'd spoken to him two days prior. Because you used to see him a lot, right? Yep. And I had seen him on his birthday. I didn't speak to him over the weekend. And the day that he died was the day that it was the Queen's Jubilee. So we had that extra bank holiday. Mm -hmm. So it was a Tuesday. And um, I called him on the Sunday. No, on the Monday we spoke. And then 6am Tuesday morning, I got a private number call. Um, and it was the hospital and they said, oh, you need to come now. You need to come now. And I was like, why? What for? Um, obviously I was my dad's next of kin. Um, and I was like, it's 6am. Like, do I have mm. to come now? Can I come later? Cause obviously he had a lot of ailments. So I'm like, what is it? Can you mm. tell me? They're like, no, you need to come now. And I said, well, you need to tell me what's wrong with him. Mm. And, um, the nurse, whoever called me, <clears throat> um, didn't put the phone on mute. But whispered to somebody else, she wants to know what's wrong. Mm. And I just dropped the phone because I was like, what? (laughs) But through the whole journey, I think my sister ended up brushing my teeth and we went to the hospital. And on the whole drive, I was just like, any sign that it's not what I think it is, I'm just waiting. Um, And so I was in disbelief up until we got to the hospital and... We were waiting for somebody to pay attention to the fact that we were waiting to talk to someone. And somebody came, I can't remember if it was a nurse or a doctor. And I said, oh, you know, I said my dad's name. Um, and they said, okay, let me take you to the family room. And I just collapsed right in the middle of the ward, um, the A&E. And they had us sitting in there for two hours before they came and actually said that my dad had died. And he had died at like 5 a.m. Oh, mate. Um... And then we left the hospital and I remember in being in the car, my sister was driving and I saw someone waiting at the bus stop and I got so angry because I was like, how dare you wait for a bus? Like I've lost my dad. <laughs> that was in my mind. I was like, how dare you live life? Yeah. Like my world has crumbled. That's it's popped down. Cause you were daddy's girl. I was his only child. Yeah. I mean, the loss that you feel on the day Mm. it stays with you Mm. and I don't know 
why people think that just because years have gone by, mm, mm. you know, time is a healer, but you, you can, as we talk about it, you can feel I the feel emotion. It. Like, yeah. I feel, you can feel the emotion. Yeah, for I sure. I feel it. And it's like what? It brings me back to mm-hmm. that feeling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I had a really similar call and we were together the day before. Yeah. We went to mm. see that drive film hustlers. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> and I remember posting the pictures and, you know, on the weekends I go to see my mum with my daughter. And I remember also getting a call and they were saying, oh, mum's not doing too good. And I said, it's okay. Just making breakfast. I'm on my way. Mm. And then the nurse called back and I said, ah, yes, Antonio. What did you forget? And he said, she's gone. Mm -mm. And I couldn't, I can't believe it. And even though, you know, my mum had uh, dementia and she was ill for seven years and had lost the ability to communicate verbally, Mm. She was still my mum. And so, you know, people was like, oh, yeah, but she'd left the building a long time. And even I started to say that myself, you know, (laughs) it's just the body that's there. But there is nothing like when it actually happens Mm -hmm. because there's no run up that could prepare you for that day. When you left the hospital, Mm. what did you do? (laughs) Well, first things first is um, we went to the home and my dad had recently, because he was ended up being disabled, and he had recently, like, one month before, three weeks before, got a car, and he wanted to start driving again, mm. and it was all adapted. So we went, and first thing, we said, okay, we need to sort out this car, because we need to return it, or whatever. But we went in his room, and we were going through papers, because my dad told me when I was maybe, like, seven, that he had life insurance. mm mm-hmm. So <laughs> this was like totally unexpected. Like I said, he was, I thought he was invincible. No, he didn't. He wasn't mobile. Um, he'd lost an eye. <laughs> he like, he had so many things like wrong with him, but in his mind, he was still there and he, you know, was going to dialysis three times a week. So I was like, yeah, cool. You know, he's not going to die. But then mm-hmm. I thought, oh yeah, I did remember him saying life insurance. So I thought, well, no. I called my friend who had lost her dad Mm. and she was the only other person I knew that had lost a parent because I was like, what do you do now? Yeah. No one don't. I mean, at that point, like loss wasn't happening around us like it's happening now. And you don't really know many people of our age that have have experienced parental loss either. And so you don't know. Yeah. And people don't get it. No, you, you have to find somebody that has been through it. To be like, okay, what do I do? What's the next step? I'm guessing mm. there's steps to take, but what's the first step? Um, so we, we rooted around the room, didn't find any paperwork. So I thought, well, there's no life insurance there. Um, and no, I think we found a letter that said that it had lapsed and yeah. he hadn't kept up with the payments. So no life insurance. So wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> so no, so the impact of having no life insurance, what that means. Well. Is that you've got a funeral to pay for now. Mm -hmm. Because that's the first thing that people want. Mm -hmm. They want you to take the body. Mm -hmm. They want you to take the body out of their premises, whether it be the hospital or the home, to find yourself. The first thing they ask you is, what um, funeral home are you using? Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I ended up Googling (laughs) funeral homes near me. (laughs) Do you know, like, (laughs) what else are you supposed to do? But this is the thing. People don't, people don't, think that you'll have to use your everyday skills no. to go through this time. No. You would think that there's actually a logistical process that you have yeah. to go through, but there isn't. No. You have to literally draw upon whatever you do in your day-to-day life, like you would find a restaurant, yeah. like you would find a holiday, go on Google. Yeah. Because who do and, you want? But at the time as well, emotionally, you're not even there, you know? No, this is it. You're just on autopilot. You're just You're just processing. You're just doing, you're just carrying on. And for me, I was the only child Mm -hmm. like you Mm -hmm. who was available and present to do it. Mm -hmm. So everything was on me. Mm -hmm. Everything. Like everything was on you. You have a sister, you have a half sister. Yep. I have a sister that's a half sister and it wasn't my pet. That wasn't the daughter of your dad. No. So it's all on you. Yeah. So I remember us talking about this and you, your dad's church started a, (laughs) is it a GoFund? Well, you know, I don't even know if they had GoFund in 2012, to be fair. But, well, no, what they did, well, what, okay, so my dad was a gospel singer and he knew a lot of people from a lot of churches. And before we'd even reached the home from the hospital, my phone started ringing 
bishops and pastors. Oh, wow. People call in. So where are you going to hold it? In our church, this church, we've got 2,000 capacity. we got this, we've got... And I'm like, hold on. I don't even know what my name is right now, let alone what I'm going to do. Um, so it was a big saga between him passing away and the funeral. But no, what happened was another pastor who I'd never, never even contacted me put on Facebook, on my dad's Facebook page, tagged my dad in a post. And I never was, was a friend. I didn't even know my dad had a Facebook until after he passed <laughs> away. Um, saying the body's stuck in the hospital. So we need money, um, now, um, because the family don't have any money and, um, we need to get the body. He's going to be in the hospital. He's been in the hospital and he'll stay there because there's nowhere for him to go. Who gave this man this message? I don't know, but I was obviously furious. And, um, yeah, no one started a GoFundMe. It was, um, the GoFundMe was me calling up family members and <laughs> how'd that make you feel? Well, terrible. Cause I've never really, not never really, I'm not a person to ask people for help in general. Um, I don't like to put burden on anyone, but I was 23. I just started a new job three weeks prior. Um, I wasn't going to get paid for another five weeks because I'd missed the pay date and I had no money. Um, I was living at my mum's. I didn't have any savings. And funerals. Uh, <laughs> hey! So I didn't bury my mum. Mm. I cremated my mum because that was her wish. Mm-hmm. And even that was expensive. Mm-hmm. So funeral, they say an average funeral is £15,000. Well, we, well, I did good then. <laughs> Where are we supposed to find £15,000 as children of the deceased? Dig it out your eye. Must be. Because it's really heartbreaking to know that you've lost your parents and the first thing they want to know is it's £75 a day to hold the body and any days after this is another £100. And if you want um, not a cardboard box, it's £900. <laughs> Don't and even it's... start about the cardboard box business. because And you've got to show out as well because this is your dad, well, a gospel singer. Well, this is it. This is it. Gospel singer, well known in the church circles, you know, a very proud man. Um poor in money but rich in spirit and how do I represent that when I've not got one pound to my name um did you resent that at that point I at, not at that point I think I was numb for a lot of the process mm. um because like I said I was 23 I barely knew what I was doing with my life let alone to make these big decisions mm. And the weight and the the burden was just on me as his only child. And I'd had a part of that experience of the the burden from him being ill and being his next of kin through all these operations and him going to a home and whatever. And it was a lot. I didn't, I didn't resent him at that point, but I resented people around me Mm -hmm. because they made it. They made me feel bad for asking for help. I went to family members and um, (laughs) they said, he don't need no big, big funeral. He don't need no big, big funeral. (laughs) No one said. It's going to be a big, big funeral. And um, my family is not big, but relatives, you know, wider relatives. You know, I've been to their funerals and horse and carriage and all sorts. Mm. And I wasn't asking for that. But at the same time, I wasn't going to bury my dad in a cardboard box. So how I found my funeral home was through Google. Yeah. (laughs) How did I find the funeral home? Because we went to about three or four funeral homes. Some of them, oh gosh. Mm -mm. They were, the spirit of the people was as dead as the people that they were looking after. Some of the... No, <laughs> no, seriously, like, I went with my sister and we... I remember we went to one in Halston and the man had... He didn't have no vibe, like, mm. none. Not even a professional vibe, not even a customer service vibe. Yeah. We were like, no. And any funeral home that we went to, they kept saying the body, the body, the body, the oh, body. And I was like, it's my dad. Like, Stop saying the body. It's, it's my dad. Stop saying the body. Like, it's a person. Stop saying the body. And we went to co-op and I remember I saw this nice casket and it was three and a half grand. 
And I said, well, and it had praying hands on it. And I thought, I saw it and I said, my dad would love this. And I said, oh, is there anything you can do? I was trying to barter with the woman, big, big co-op funeral home. And um, she wasn't having it. And she flipped the page to the cardboard ones. You know, these are more affordable. And I was like, no, 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 I don't, I don't want that. I don't want that for my dad. No. So I thought, I'm going to find this casket. I must go find it cheaper. Google. No, you didn't. Because I saw the casket that I wanted as well. And I had the same conversation. What people were telling me is, why have this big, big casket if you're going to burn her? Mm, Yeah, this is it, yeah. And when people said that to me, not only did it make me question my decision to cremate Mm. her, but it was like she didn't deserve to go beautifully. Mm. She deserved to go in a cardboard box because I was just burning her people are people are so callous with their words and in general in day-to-day life but when you're 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 at the precipice of grief you're not even there yet to start grieving the words can cut you so deep ah and those those i don't even know if those wounds heal to become scars because like now like i said it's eight and a half years since I've lost my dad, it's a couple of years since you've lost your mum and the pain is still fresh. Were people there for you, like friends? No. Well, yes. But I don't think anyone could have been there for me. Mm. Because I wanted my dad. Yeah. So nobody's love could replace my dad's love. And do you think in relationships you, you're still seeking that? For sure. Yeah. For sure. And when does it come to a point that you realise that you're not going to find it because no one will ever be him? Well, I don't have the answer to that one. <laughs> I'm still... I don't know. Um, I think my my friends were there for me. But again, no one had lost... I had one friend that had lost a parent. No one... None of my friends had lost parents mm. to know what it is that I'm experiencing. You know, my mum had lost her dad, but he was 82. Yeah, he'd lived his life. Um, And my friend who had lost her dad, he was ill for a long time. Um, And so similar situation to your mum, he also had dementia. So it was a process, but f- no one had an experience like me where it was just here today gone gone tomorrow tomorrow. and it was fully unexpected nobody felt my pain like no one could feel my pain i don't think i've met anybody yet that has had the same experience as me to say that they feel my pain so i was i was broken but you know what black women do you push forward i had a funeral to to sort out yep and i felt Guilty to cry. Mm, yeah, but I was wait. I was even trying to wring the tears out of your eyes. I know. I couldn't cry. There was... It was stuck. Mm. And it stuck in my throat. It stuck in my being. And I couldn't cry because also, I had things to do. Hmm. Ain't no one got time for crying right now. And you got a child no to look after. No one's got... I've got a child to look after. I've got to get my mum. My mum, like yours, was a very proud mum and she mm. wanted this... She wanted this quiet funeral, but you know, deep down, she wanted it saucy and classy. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to meet everyone's wishes, her brother's wishes, who, you know, I'm asking myself, why now? Um, You know, and you you think, you know, people were speaking up of things that they wanted when they weren't involved in her departure, you know, and her Mm -hmm. journey to death. And I thought to myself, everyone's got. I've got to keep, I've got, my sister was really very emotional about mm. it but she and that was because she was mild that five that she was in america she had this space she, yeah and she had the space too and she also had a husband to grieve with and children to grieve with and i only had myself That's and i remember story. when mum died and i started crying um ashley said to me mom i didn't know you could cry oh. and i said oh and I swallowed and I was like, let me stop. She went, mm. stop crying. It's scaring me. And I realized whatever I went through before then, no matter the breakup, divorce, whatever, I didn't show her that emotion, together. but I couldn't once I received that phone call to say, my mom's, she's gone. 
Um, and I remember driving to the hospital or the, the home and all I wanted to do was touch her warm body. Mm. And But I know she was dead. So I walked in the room and I'd never been around Did a dead body. Did you touch body. her mom? I touched her, I kissed her and I held on to do her Do you know body. I couldn't touch my dad? And that gave me peace. I wonder what it didn't do for you. You know, I couldn't touch my dad. They had him in a bed on a ward <laughs> at the end. These people were alive. And I was just like, he died in the, in the ambulance. Mm. So they brought him to the hospital and he was just, and the curtains were drawn. And I went and he looked like he was sleeping. Mm. And my sister touched his hand. And I couldn't because I didn't want to feel that he was cold. So I rushed to the hospital mm. with my daughter. And everybody mm. was like, no, you can't take her. You can't take her. And I'm like, look, I need to see my mum. Mm. And I need to touch her while she's warm. Don't ask me why that it's warm, important. cold. It's important. That's you know, la- it's, it's, a, it's a symbol of life, isn't it? The warmth. Yes. And no one knows this, actually. I took a picture of her mm. that no one's seen. Not even my sister's seen it um, of my mum when she was dead. Um, because at that moment she looked like she was sleeping. Sleeping, and it's mad, isn't it? She looked peaceful and beautiful oh, and calm Sorry. and amazing, mm-hmm. and she was warm. And I held her hand, and I felt it go cold. Mm-mm. Her temperature dropped, and it dropped, and it dropped until she was cold. And I held on until that time. And for me. That was one of the hardest moments of my life, feeling the life yeah, that is literally leave her. yeah, yeah. I I couldn't. I I I saw my, and I envied my sister. As I said, it it's not her biological dad, but she grew up with him. She's my older sister, and she touched him, and I I I, I went. My hand was like five centimetres from his hand and I just I couldn't because I just thought if it's cold mm. I don't know if I'd be able to cope. Unlike you I cried a lot mm. but I didn't you know I like to cry I'm a cry <laughs> <clears throat> but I didn't cry fully I didn't mm. ball yeah because I thought if I ball and I break, I don't know if I can get back together. Yeah, that's it. So, it's the getting back. Yeah, you just shed one, two, two. You go, a little, mm-hmm, and then you move on. Yeah. And then you, you, you pick up and you do what you need to do. But, whee! It's mm-mm, a lot. It's, and then, yeah. it's seeing the body in the home. So after I saw her, I decided that I wasn't going to see her again. I don't see her. And my sister, and then... I had to go shopping oh. for underwear for her to be buried in, mm. for clothes, for a week. So I'm in H&M in Croydon, in the underwear section, mm. buying <clears throat> underwear mm-hmm. for my dead mum. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> I was like, seriously? Is this what people have to I've do? I've got to shivers because, yeah. Mm. I had to buy a bra. I had to buy underwear because you know culturally we you send them looking great. Yeah, you listen, have to look Chris. What she had to get? They're tights. going to meet the she Lord. Had to get the Lord. She had to get new shoes. She had to yeah, get new, new everything. Wig. New everything. She, I had to buy makeup for my mom because the, the woman said, "Oh, use your makeup." I mm. couldn't use my makeup, no. and then you. No, that's a, that's a no. That's a no because every time you pick up the foundation, no, no, we don't need. We were that. the same complexion, but it wasn't going to happen. We don't need that. So I bought her makeup, I had to buy everything, blusher, everything, new wig, this, that. Hmm. Dropped it off. And then my sister came. She flew in now a couple of days before the funeral. And she's like, come, let's go in the room and see mum. I said, Mm-mm, not me. I ain't going in there. So she gone in, she went, oh, mum looks beautiful. You got to come. I said, I don't want to go. She dragged me in the room. Mm-mm. Still here. Mm-mm. The image of my mum I saw Mm-mm. was not the limb image that I left. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. And, that and there was always... a reason that you took that photo. There's a reason that you took that photo, and that was what you wanted your last memory memory to be. I didn't see my dad until the funeral. And when you saw him, I bought. 
because he had an autopsy because he died in the ambulance. So apparently, if you die in NHS care, you have to have autopsy. Or, no, not in a hospital or some. I don't even know. He had an autopsy anyway. And because it was bank holiday, I had to wait like 10 days mm. to find out why he actually died. Because I, I, up until this point, I didn't actually know. And the reason why I cried at the funeral is me and my dad have got these same big Dumbo ears. Like, this is my dad's exact ear. <laughs> and obviously, you know, they open the casket and everyone goes to view the body. And we went last. And I cried my eyes out. I think I broke at that point because I looked at his face and I said, mm, yeah. I mean, yeah, I guess he looks the same. But then I looked at his ear. And I mean, I don't, I've don't. i never Googled how they do autopsy. I can't actually watch any of the shows since my dad's passed about how they do autopsies because his ear was not this ear. So that's what broke me. I, I want us to recognise how difficult this topic is to talk about. Um, and we had to take a little break because for Shakisha and I, this is probably the first time that we've had to talk about the losses. Mm-hmm. And that's what we do. And even though we are strong black queens, even queens sometimes our crown, you know, falls for a minute, but we pick it back up. No, I don't know it tilts. It tilts. It tilts. It tilts. tilts. It tilts. It tilts. It tilts. <laughs> so we were talking about um, the days of the funeral. Um, and how difficult it was to actually uh, view the bodies of our loved ones. Uh, some people's choice is not to view it. Uh, you know, some people have open casket, some don't. And your dad did. Uh, so bring me back to that moment that you were in the church and you walked past his body. Yes, yeah, so I remember everyone went first and we were sitting at the front. My dad's funeral was quite funny because... Church, I don't want to call it church beef, but he had six people preaching. Wow. wow. <laughs> because they couldn't choose among themselves for one person to do it. So all of them was up there. Yeah. And so me and my sister kind of had a few jokes and laughed the whole way through. Um, so we let her, you know, we watched everyone go up and I saw people being emotional, but in my head, it was like, why? Why are you crying? Mm. Even though this is your dad. Yeah, it just, it, for some reason... It's like I was, to prepare myself to to look at him, okay. I had to detach from not just my emotions, but other people's. Right. So, you know, we let everyone go and everyone's going and then we were the last people to go up. And yeah, I looked at him and I was like, oh, he looks nice, smart. We bought him a new suit, new shoes, the dress socks, you know, the silky socks yeah. and gloves and whatever. His skin colour was a little bit off. off. Yeah. Mm, doesn't have that yellow undertone that it no, should have. Not at all, mate. The glow. Mm. The glow is gone. Mm-hmm. There's something different about like the Yeah. I can't I can't put it into words. Mm-hmm. But yeah. And then yeah, I looked at his I said, Yeah, you know, I think I was looking at him to see if he was alright. Mm. If that made it's, I don't know, it's a bit weird, yeah. isn't it? But I looked at him My to see if he was... said the same thing. Yeah. She was looking to see mum looking nice. Yeah. And I didn't want to see mum looking nice because that's not how I wanted to... S- My last memory of nice to look like. It wasn't even... I was like, yeah, you're dre-. Like, I thought, okay, we've represented you well because okay. obviously all these people had seen him before me and I hadn't seen him mm. un- since the day at the hospital. Mm. So I wanted... I said, okay, yeah. You know, all these people have seen you and you look, you look all right. Yeah. But do you look okay? Mm. But how does somebody that's not alive look okay? okay? And so I was, you know, scanning him and then I looked at his ear. And that's when I broke down Mm. because me and my dad have the exact same ear. Mm. And this ear that I looked at was not my dad's ear. Oh, mate. Because he'd had an autopsy and I had guess and they did whatever they did. And his ear didn't look the same. And so that's when I think I lost it. Yeah, and I just broke down crying. Did you feel at that moment like you had to contain that breakdown or did you just... Do you know what? No, because this is my dad. Mm. 
And I mean, I cried at the beginning of the funeral <laughs> um, because I refused for my dad. My I wanted my dad to be brought in to one of his songs and brought out to one of his songs. And we had had this whole thing set up in the church. I gave them the CD. I said, I just put the two tracks on one CD, no mm. confusion. Ready, they're lifting my dad up out of the hearse and where's the music? And I, I, I want to say I was a diva. Can you say you was a diva yeah. at a funeral? Yep. I was a diva. Like, I, I said, don't bring him in. Wow. Where's the music? Mm. Play the music. Yeah. And they're faffing about and they're faffing about and all now the music's not playing. And I said, he's not going in without the music playing. I want his song to be playing. And I think eventually somebody, I don't remember who, probably said, you know, suck it yourself. <laughs> and I remember my ex ran home from the church because he figured out that there was a lead that they didn't have, which is why the music wasn't playing. And he ran home to get this lead so that coming out, yeah, dad would have his music. Yeah. And it's those moments that you don't forget. Mm. I mean, I remember having to talk. I don't know if you spoke at your mum's funeral. So I had to... My um, dad. Yes, yeah, sorry, your dad. Um, I had to give a speech at my mum's. And I was like, okay, I can do this. So that's why I was containing myself throughout. Mm. I was like, right, you can't be barling now because mm. it would... It would choke up. So I remember saying, right, this is you hosting. You're presenting. Like, I had to detach. Your, yeah. I had to get up in front of everybody. Even when I walked in, I didn't. I could see people. Mm. But I was like, right, I'm not looking. Mm. And I remember holding my daughter's hand and she, you know, looking so cute, coming in. And I was like, come on, we got this, we got this. Mm. And I just felt like, in retrospect, that I wish I could have been emotionally so, present mm. on that day instead of pretending Instead of having to put on an act, I really, I think that really stopped my my mourning and my grief of my mum. Mm. Because, you know, that day is is closure. So it, it took up to the point of going into the crematorium and um, shutting the curtains and knowing that was the last time. I didn't even come into the crematorium. Right. I couldn't. It was, it was so... I didn't, I've never been in a cremation. Mm. And so your mum's creation, cremation to be the last. The first. The first. The, the, the curtain shut. Yeah, that is a madness. Woo! The finality of the curtain shutting is, um, I think, I almost think it's more traumatising than them lowering a coffin or a casket into the ground and putting Do dirt you? on it. Do you? Because when I heard, like, I've been to funerals, and when you hear the stone... The dirt. Oh, hey. uh, yeah, it is a bit old. And yeah, then, I, for me, Caribbean funerals, when those old birds start singing... <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> when I tell you, they take me to another place. And I think they <laughs> almost force the, the, the emotion. emotion mm, you have and they all start singing together. Yeah. And it's like, it's like, you know when you're church and then pastor starts to speed mm, up mm-hmm. and you start to feel it? Mm-hmm. And I feel like... The spirit. It was yeah, yeah. that, and I started thinking, have I done the right thing? Should I have cremated her? Mm. Should I have not cremated her? Should I have? And then I remember walking out of the crematorium, and I heard a wail. Someone screamed, and I looked behind, and it was my aunt, who had been contained mm. this whole time. And when she broke, I broke. Because mm. sometimes it just takes that one moment that someone else is expressive it's almost like permission yeah when you see someone else let go yeah it's like oh okay and they don't look too mad so no, maybe th- i yeah can. yeah because i was determined not to be the typical west indian on the floor, on the floor. yeah i didn't want to be her mm. i didn't want to be that mad woman that looks back and think oh god why yeah. did you do that yeah. but that's their grief and if that's how someone wants to grieve <clears> then why not? Why do you know, do we I feel? watched something randomly the other day and it was about, you know, how people have kept should keep this stiff upper lip mm. and contain their emotions. Mm. But in other cultures, when mm. somebody passes away, you know, they hire people to wail. Wow. They hire people to go up and down the streets wailing that these people that that's their job yeah. because they want people to know 
that there's this sadness on this family and let it out. Yeah. But I don't know where we've got this thing from where, I mean, losing anybody, losing a parent, somebody that was (laughs) instrumental in you being on this Mm -hmm. earth, why should you not have license to be on the floor? Yeah. Why do we have to feel like we should keep it together? All the time. I remember when at my dad's funeral, I didn't speak because mm -mm, I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I remember when I was doing order of service, I said, auntie who, my niece, my Mm -hmm. nephew, my sister did the eulogy. I could not speak, but I said I wanted to sing a song. Mm -hmm. And it was the one song me and my dad recorded together. Mm -hmm. And it was the first time that I remember... I'm not saying that he never did before, but the first time I remember him saying he was proud of me. Mm. But he never had no backing track yet. My ex still hadn't come back with the lead. So. <laughs> Gosh. So I sang this song a cappella. But in my, <laughs> my when I sat down, my sister said, you look like a crackhead. <laughs> oh, God. Really? Because I was like, mm, and I'm slapping my leg and... Yeah, nodding my head because I'm hearing the music, music, but also I had to focus on hearing the music that no one else could hear yeah. so that I could get through the song. Yeah, and I don't even know how I sang, I don't even know. I was probably out of tune. Mm. People, I don't, I don't remember anybody's reaction. Mm. I remember when I was singing, two people walked out of the church, Ooh. and that was for a whole nother reason. Oh, I not because, okay. Oh, I hope not anyway. <laughs> Oh, no, two people, two well-known pastors mm. walked out of the church. And um, yeah, it was mad because I think they, well, my mum asked me to perform the song again at the wake. I don't like that word, you know. Yeah. The after bit. Yeah. Because, okay, so where does that word wake come from? Because are we know. trying to awaken the dead? I don't know why it's awake. I don't, I, I don't know. Like and also, why do we need it? Because, you know, we were talking about money earlier. Mm. And, I'll, you know, financially, I know there was a fund. But how, how did the funeral impact you financially? Well, I think the, my dad's funeral getting paid for is one of my biggest life testimonies. Because mm. as I explained before, I didn't have no money. Mm. I went to family and... It was basically like, we ain't got no money. And I told you that, <clears throat> excuse me, I Googled, you know, I did a Google search to find a casket. Mm. And I found a casket that co was said was three and a half grand. I found it for 999. Mm. And I thought, ooh. I said, oh, is it all right to get a bargain yeah. in this situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I ain't got no money. Mm. So I called the people and I said, do I have to take your services or can I just buy the casket from mm. you? And they said, you can just buy the casket, but come in and talk to us. Mm. And I went in and spoke to them and they were the first people that called my dad, my dad and not the body. Mm. And they were so sweet. And I said, I want, I want you to do my dad's funeral. Mm. And they said, wherever he, where is he? Is he in Scotland? Where, wherever he is in the UK, we'll go and get him. Don't worry about it. We'll look after him. And I was like, yeah, I want you to do it. And so when they told me the cost, it's like four grand for the flowers and whatever and whatever else they do. I can't remember, to be honest. Mm. And I said, oh, it's a lot of money. I went and I got the plot. Mm. That was four grand. Yeah. So already at eight. I ain't got no money and I ain't got no job. (laughs) And one pastor or bishop or somebody called me and said, we need a breakdown of these costs. We need a breakdown because we're having a fundraiser at the church. 3,000 people. They never invited me. They never told me when it was. Apparently, they had it, you know. So, say this was two weeks had passed, and I thought, boy, all now, I ain't got no money. I've been scrounging. I've been trying to get the money. I've begged, borrowed, stole, tried, but no one, I can't get the money from nowhere. And one of my friends, my good, good friend, bless her, I remember one day I just had to get out of the house and I went to her workplace and I just cried in the car and I said I don't know where I'm going to get this money from mm-hmm. but the funeral we can't have no funeral because I can't pay for nothing and she said I've got some savings you know mm-hmm. I remember at this time we're 23 yeah. I said I've got some savings I've got a few thousand you can have it I said I would never 
take that from me. But I said, God's going to make a way and I just have to believe. I thought, let me call the funeral home and find out <clears throat> what exactly the balance is. The woman said £4.38. So, excuse me? She said £4.38 left to pay. I said, what? She said, oh, what? Did you did you already pay the £4? Did, is it? I said, no. Yeah. What do you mean £4.38? She said, well, people have been paying. People have been calling us to pay. And I mm. had given out <clears throat> the details because I said, I don't want the money. Mm. Send it to the funeral home. If you have a change or whatever, please send it. But obviously when I'm asking these people, they're telling me no. Mm. Who paid for the funeral? How the funeral got paid for? I don't know. God knows. I don't know. That is absolutely amazing. I literally, like, li I'm telling you, if anyone don't want to say that miracles can't happen or miracles don't exist, let me tell you, my God is real. Because we went from over, we got up to nine grand to £4.38. Oh. That is amazing. So, as a woman now, that is embarking on relationships with men, mm. what does the impact of your father's loss have on you mm. and your relationships with men? Mm. I think my, my dad even being alive had um, impact on my relationships with men mm. anyway. Okay. Now that he's gone, I remember a few years back, a couple of years after he passed away, I thought, rah, when I get married... Who's going to walk me down the oh. aisle? And my dad couldn't walk for years, but I always imagined him in a wheelchair alongside me. Mm. I thought, right, he's not here. And I don't have men in my family. Mm. That's how it's my nephew. He's 11 years younger than me. Mm. And I said, Jordan, would you mind if whenever I get married, would you walk me down the aisle? He said, yeah, come on, Kishi. Of course, of course. <laughs> yeah, we do, of course. And that time he was just a young teenager. Yeah. But now I'm in a relationship and I'm like, oh, you'll never meet my dad. That's it. It's a never meeting. Because how do you know me without knowing my parents? This is it. Because I am my parents. Mm -hmm. I am my mum. Like, mm -hmm. there's a picture of my mum. Do you remember that picture of my mum when she was 18? Mm, you. It's That's me. me. Mm -hmm. And it's not until we found that picture... Um, it looks so old, but it's me. And I am her and I am a lot of her. Well, I'm my dad too, you know. Mm. And as much as I wanted to deny it, I am very much him, you know. Mm. Um, he was a life and soul of the party. He was a sound man. He was a entrepreneur. Then he was a builder. Then he was a chef. Then he was a, the man was everything, you know. Mm. And my flexibility to do stuff came from him. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much I wanted to deny it and think, oh, nah, yeah, I'm my dad, but... I want my future. I want my daughter. My daughter's mm. never met my dad. She don't know who granddad is. <clears throat> That's one thing that... It, like, it makes me tighten up inside. Mm. And that is like... I don't have children yet. Yeah. And... They'll never know... Well, no, actually, that's a lie. I said they never see my dad in the physical form. Mm. But you see, my dad made a lot of music... Original Tony Rich, please go and check him out. Spotify, Apple, someone's stealing the royalties, but get be blessed anyway. Be blessed anyway. Oh God, that's a whole nother. It's <laughs> <laughs> a whole nother chat. <laughs> um, shameless plug. Um, but my dad <laughs> has left so much music. And one thing about my dad is that he liked to talk in the songs. Ah, so he doesn't just sing. You can hear his voice. voice. Yeah. And I've got photos. I don't have... There's one video on YouTube, one music video that he did, which I found after he died. Yeah. And he's done. And it's when he can move and he's dancing and whatever. And I only watch that once a year because I can't cope. Mm. But still, it's on YouTube. It's there forever. Unless... No, it's there forever. Yeah. And so I'm like, okay. When I have children... We can get that downloaded. You know a man who can. Thank you. <laughs> um... When I have children, there's things there. Yeah. So you might not be able to touch him or hug him or smell him or see him 
in 3D. Yeah. But you can hear him and you can feel the spirit through his voice, through his music, watch him jumping up and down and... You know, at his funeral, so many people that I'd never met, never heard of in my life. I don't know how they heard about the funeral. Come one man said, when I did first come to England, is your dad that picked me up from the airport. Oh, nice. And, and, and he's such a good man. 25 years, I never see him, but I had to be here today. And those kind yeah. of things are so nice to hear. Yeah. I didn't know this man. I couldn't tell you who the man is now. Mm. So many people were talking to me on that day. Yeah, I got your dad's music. I got... I don't know who you are. Who? So he left a legacy. And I think yes. that's what you've got to take forward. That even though he's not here, he's left a legacy with you. Mm. And talking about legacy, I've got another guest that's coming to talk about their loss. And then we'll mm. bring Keish back. And we'll all talk together how it means to be here collectively. So thank you for our first part. Thank you.